Hello, everyone. My name is Ivy Jarvis, and I'm a programming librarian at the Glendale Public Library. I'm here today with Michael and Patty Silvershire, who have generously offered to share their time and expertise with our songwriters community at the 25th Annual Arizona Songwriters Gathering. Michael and Patty Silvershire have been collaborating on music since the late 1970s. They have written hundreds of songs and scores for Walt Disney, Jim Henson, Sony, Children's Television Workshop, the Warner Brothers, in, including the theme songs to the TV series, Adventures of the Gummy Bears, Tailspin, and Pajanimals. During this program, titled The Changing Face of Children's Music, you will learn how to write for characters in standalone productions, as well as series and specials. This combined lecture and performance will offer insight into creating your own character projects as they discuss scoring the animated series, <clears throat> the use of light motif and music to picture, music for children's theater and educational touring shows, and international markets versus niche markets. Now I'd like to turn it over to John Iger, who is co-founder of the Arizona Songwriters Association, so he can say a few words. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, Ivy. Uh, <laughs> we're so glad to be here today and have such great guests and such great help from uh, Glendale Public Library. So um, we are going to have some guests that have been with Arizona Songwriters several times in the past over the years, uh, like none of us remember exactly what date, but uh, the uh, 80s and uh, 90s, I think two or three times they've been here before. And uh, we always feel honored to have them. And especially when people come back, you know, then they must have uh, had a good time and, and been treated okay. And so everything worked out, even uh, in the summertime in Arizona. So, uh, and also, these are great people because um, I'm kind of biased about this, but um, they started the uh, Northern Cal Songwriters Association, um, and uh, and it's still going now as the West Coast Songwriters Association or West Coast Songwriters. And uh, you know anybody that uh, that feels that way about helping songwriters is okay in my book. <laughs> yeah, and, and to keep it going that long is, is amazing. And you guys have a real deal up there. I've been several times and, uh, and treated very nicely by Ian and Joni, and I haven't met Poppy yet. But, uh, great. <laughs> all right, so, um, I think that's about all, you know, they, these guys are good and they, uh, you know, Grammy nominations and things like that. We're going to have some treats uh, from their musical archives uh, in, uh, in a few minutes here. And so this is going to be good and we're really happy to have them here. Patty and Michael, take Thanks. it away. <laughs> Okay, and I guess I'm starting, of course, that's according to my little list of things here, sort of get into the origin story of how Patty and I started working together and started doing things together. Um, I have been writing, uh, I've been a, writing songs since I was a little kid, started when I was eight, and I just, I moved the piano into my bedroom when I was 11. It was a spinet, so it wasn't that big, but I was still pretty big for a little guy to, to drag across the floor to get in there. But, uh, but I've been writing songs and doing music for many years. I had been a staff writer for the Fifth Dimension when I was just out of high school uh, for a very short period of time because I found out that that wasn't what I wanted to do. Writing pop songs for that particular uh, market was not what I really wanted to do. And so I found myself falling into theater works in Palo Alto. And uh, what I did at theater works was I failed. <laughs> and I think this is a very important, this is one, the first important thing I can say 
everybody needs a great place to fail because you want to be able at where 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 it doesn't matter to the industry if you fail in big public you may not ever work again but if you fail in a small place where you're working with people who are sympathetic who will help you learn then you will really have a leg up on everybody else because you really will know how to succeed and to succeed because if you just do nothing but succeed you don't really learn anything from your success but if you fail that for me it was i was writing music that was out of key out of style and out of character for theater shows but by the time i was done i had done, did 44 shows at uh, the theater works in palo alto over a 10-year period by the time i was done i knew how to write in key in style and in character and i knew how to write it fast so that whenever as you go into the business and people say oh we need it yesterday that's not a problem <laughs> you 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 can do that and that was actually the secret of our success is being able to write well and fast and Patty and I, uh, when I, I met her, I had been at the theater for about seven years at that point in time. We never worked together. And we, uh, uh, I had been, I was looking in the local newspaper and there was an international song contest for a Christmas song. And so I wrote something, lyrics and all, and uh, I showed it to Patty. And she said, do you mind if I rewrite these lyrics? <laughs> and I said, who do you think you are? <laughs> said, sure, okay, we'll try it. We'll see what, what happens. So she rewrote the lyric to this song. It's called Christmas in My Heart. And she changed it and we won the contest. <laughs> so I said, this is pretty auspicious. And uh, I got over my begrudgingness of working with a collaborator <laughs> like that pretty, pretty quickly. And one of the things that happened, we were, um, I had been in a, I had a song contract, a, a music contract. And this guy was taking me for everything I had. And so we got together creatively and we got together business wise because she figured out how to get out of the contract as well. And uh, we did that. And we decided that it wasn't just me, but there were people I knew in uh, groups all over the place who were having trouble with their business and also wanted to talk about creatively writing songs. So we got together 13 or 14 people in our living room. And they brought more people the next month and they brought more people the next month till about four months in we had 99 people we had, couldn't be in the living room we had to be out in the front yard and we decided to give ourselves a name and we called ourselves the south bay songwriters association sbsa and we got sponsored by the palo alto council for the arts and they became our umbrella corporation uh, a nonprofit as we were getting ready to get our nonprofit status figured out, we, where we get our, our um, board of directors and our bylaws and everything together. And we took a year to do that. But at the end of the year, we became a full-fledged nonprofit association. And we, then, then that, that place is, they've changed their name three times from South Bay Songwriters to Northern California Songwriters and now to the West Coast Songwriters. And they're represented all the way from Washington State down to San Diego in California. I was very, very happy to see the, the growth in the group. <clears throat> and people who are professionals love to come to those conferences as well, because we have a, a real good atmosphere and, a, and, very, and it's a, really, a real community. Because that's always been very important to Patty and me both, is creating community. That makes that makes a sense. So, we uh, when we were working with starting off with the South Bay songwriters, and we had our office in our garage, and <laughs> we had a six hundred foot 
uh, farmer's cottage that we were living in. And we had a one car garage that became the office for uh, NCSA. And one of our volunteers uh, said to us one day, you know, my brother-in-law works for Disney and they're looking for some music. Do you think you'd be interested in submitting something? And uh, so Patty and I said, sure. And uh, we talked to somebody, I forget who it was, who mentioned that they were doing a record called Mickey Mouse Rocks. So we, on a Friday, um, oh, they also needed the songs yesterday. Yeah, they also said they needed the songs yesterday. So I said, okay, that's easy to do. So we wrote five songs from Friday till Saturday. Got my, we had a studio, I had a little drum drops record, which had all, all these little drum figures on it. Went to the, uh, went to a studio, put the drum drops on, played with the drum drops, just piano. And we did five songs. We wiped out our savings, all $75. And uh, we went to, uh, uh, we, we mailed it off. And um, two months later, we got our big rejection letter <laughs> saying, if you're gonna write for children's music, you gotta know, it's more, it's more sublime than you think it is. And they gave us a copy of this record, Mickey Mouse Disco. And we'll say, I won't say, oh, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But we learned a lot about writing for those characters, which is what you do. It's like writing in theater. You write for characters and who they are and their limitations and, and what they know about themselves and what they know about each other. So and, and their their actions. So we learned a lot from that. And about um, um, I guess uh, I guess we'll talk. Uh, I'll let Patty talk now. <laughs> I've said enough. Go ahead. Let's follow it. It's <laughs> great to be here. So that was, you know, two months of what do we do? We're kind of waiting to see if we we're getting to be able to get songs on this Disney album. And during that two month period, Michael, out of the blue, wrote a song called "The Whole World Sounds Like Michael McDonald," <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, this is a pretty great song." So I sent it. I the whole world sounds like Michael McDonald. The world sounds like Michael McDonald. I want to sound like Michael McDonald too. And I do. <laughs> so, so we recorded it and I sent it to our local San Jose radio station. And the next day, I get a phone call from the DJ saying that their telephone lines had completely shut down at 6 a.m. because everybody was calling in about this song. So one of the people who had heard this song was the publisher at Disney, Tom Bocci. He had heard it through Dr. Demento because when Dr. Demento heard it, Dr. Demento then took the song and started playing it on his radio station, on his radio program. Bocci had tried to contact Dr. Domino, but he never responded as to who wrote the song. So just, he just didn't, he had no clue. But then after we did write the song, we came down to Los Angeles to the Los Angeles Songwriters Showcase Conference. Uh, and we were standing in a group of people talking about our experiences. And I brought up Michael McDonald's song and this woman next to me, she goes, um, excuse me, could I talk to you? Uh, I, I work at Walt Disney Productions, and um, I'd like to introduce you. Bambi. <laughs> name is Bambi. And I'd like to introduce you to our publisher, Tom Bocci. Well, we had sort of been introduced before because of the five songs that we had been rejected. Yeah. <laughs> but we said, absolutely. So we'll go in. And we did. We went in and met him. And he told us that they were in the process now of a new album called Mouser Size. And they only had one slot left for a song. And but three other- Mickey Mouse Rock. Right, and three other, three other um, writers had already submitted a song. So he says, the song is needed yesterday. And the name of the song, we're gonna give you the title, is called Pig Out. So Michael and I went, we wrote the song immediately. We recorded it immediately, sent it in. And the day after Christmas, 
we received a check in the mail and a congratulations letter that we got our song Pig Out on the album, which went gold and platinum. So that was our first introduction to Disney. Yeah. <laughs> now they had a they were they were doing another project which they told us about. The next project was going to be called Mousetronics, uh, dealing with you know computers and all that sort of stuff. And this is before Apple had introduced the mouse. And when, in fact, we knew somebody from from Apple, and they said we're doing an album called Mousetronics about computers. And he said, "How do you know about mouses? We haven't said anything about them, but they're about to be released." And I said, "Oh, just just Mickey Mouse. <laughs> That's all I know." <laughs> So we, uh, we started writing songs for that. What happened was I, was I had been put on the Yamaha Artist Development Program. They gave me a bunch of synthesizers, about $20,000 worth of synthesizers, analog and digital, the first digital synthesizers, which were all pre-programmed. You, you couldn't program those digital synthesizers at that time, but they were, uh, they were like, a, and they were huge. And I had a G2 which was uh, almost like a grand piano with a grand piano uh, keyboard, but you had these little strips that you put into it to get it to work. Anyways, I started doing demos, uh, songs like Ho Down at the Robot Farm, One Little Android, all these things, Digital Duck, Digital Duck. Stuff, that, stuff that, had we, that we were writing that had something to do with the digital domains. And uh, we got a call, or I got a call from Gary Kressel, the president of the record company, asking me if I wanted to uh, produce the next album. <laughs> so I said, no, I, uh, I've never done that before, so I don't know what to do. And then he, by the end of the week, we had agreed to, and I ended up producing the album, but we ended up moving from our abode in Palo Alto, moving down to LA, living in Eagle Rock, California, get renting a little house just and, to produce this one album just to produce this one album and and uh the album was called they changed the name midway through oh i should tell you a story we wrote a song called mousetronics and we were looking for voices for it to sound we were trying vocorders and all this other stuff and uh tom bocce came up with the idea of trying out uh little people Billy Barty, Jerry Marin, who was the mayor of uh, Munchkinville in, uh, in, in The Wizard of Oz. And so we had these people were the first house guests that we had at our house. And Billy Barty gets out of his car and he says to me, oh, you could practically be one of us. <laughs> he asked me to join their softball team. I'm not. We are, we are both sure. vertically challenged. So anyways, but uh, anyways, we try that out. It didn't work. And we were stuck. And for like three or four months, nothing happened on this album. And then they decided to change the name of the album to Splash Dance. Because the movie Flash Dance was making a big splash at the time. So they called Splash Dance. And Gary had this wonderful picture of Mickey Mouse on a surfboard. So uh, that became the cover of the album. So we wrote a few songs for that. But they kept all our other songs, all our other electronically digital based songs for it too. So it's sort of a sort of a strange hybrid album <laughs> of, of, of ideas. But uh, when we finished doing that, we, fin we uh, produced the album and I did the first recording ever done on the, on the DX7, which was the uh, frequency modulated computer uh, a synthesizer that Yamaha came up with. With, developed with Stanford University, actually. But uh, what happened was uh, we, I recorded one little Android using that instrument exclusively. And uh, the, uh, the record came out. It did really well, although it did not quite go gold, but it sold about 400,000 copies, which is good. And But the fact is that we never stopped working after that. We wasn't any time when we when we didn't get something a call from Disney, or from somebody else interested in what we were doing. So we were lucky. We were able to capitalize on our luck. 
And that's the other thing is if you, there is no such thing as luck if you don't know how to use it, what to do with it. So anyways, uh, anyways, Gary Kreisel, who was the head of the record company at the time, decided that he wanted a new generic birthday song. So we, uh, we got on that pretty well. And uh, he, um, I'm trying to read what this says. Well, Gary basically wanted to form where the pieces of the song went. Yeah, we had, we had pieces of a song together. But he and, wanted a real emphasis on the chorus. Yeah, so we, we, we built up like that. And a lot of people have heard this song. they made it the following year was Donald Duck's 50th birthday and they want us to rewrite uh, wanted us to rewrite the lyrics to reflect Donald's birthday so we did and uh, it became a big parade down Main Street in Disneyland and in Orlando at, the, at Disney World it was our first big parade in fact we went there on the day when all the Olympic champions from the LA Olympics were at the at the park and they were all watching our parade. <laughs> That's great. It was a big thing and we, we loved it. So, so the next uh, thing we would like to talk about is when you're writing for characters in a standalone format, meaning known characters or, or little known characters. And a lot of those album projects using well-known characters, like for instance, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, that thing. And uh, some un little known characters like Gyro Gearless was from the comic strip. So, right, right. We write yeah. something about him as well. So. Right. And uh, so you want to make sure that the lyrics fit the character's actions and motivations and that they are and what they want in life and how they get there. So like, for instance, for Mickey Mouse in his early incarnation, he was basically an agent of chaos. And when you think of Kermit the Frog, Kermit is a much gentler soul who's trying to get and maintain control over a bunch of all the crazy Muppets. Um, so you're working on a new through line story with familiar characters, such as a movie or TV series, but that's slightly different. It also though, does have the same demands on the understanding of those characters. So we wrote all the songs for Disney's Little Mermaid 2. That was the movie that came after the one, the big famous one, Little Mermaid 1. And by saying that, a couple of new characters did come into that very familiar Little Mermaid setting. Morgana, Ursula's sister, but most importantly was Melody, Ariel's daughter. So when we first receive a script for the show, Melody was, was described as a thoughtful girl drawn to the seas, but she did not know why. So we wrote the song, So Many Possibilities. And by, by the time we received the seventh revision of the script, she was completely immersed in diving into the water and she was becoming a mermaid herself, thanks to Morgana. So we then wrote a song for a moment, which sings of her freedom in the water while Ariel searches for her. For a moment became the main song for the winner of the French version of American Idol. This woman performed the song from beginning of the series all the way through the entire run of the show. And she ended up winning with our song. 
So that being said, um, we, we really loved writing for this movie, just wonderful songs. We had so much fun. And in the last version of the script we were given, a description of the opening scene with sparse dialogue. So they had one song only that they said, write a song for this particular place in the script. But instead of that, we went ahead and we wrote the entire opening sequence of the movie as a musical theme, as a musical scene. And that really was, again, with all of Michael's theatrical background, just was wonderful for us to take all that, those words and put the entire, the entire first act into a song. And one of the things that was great for, for me is when I, we did the demo, uh, that they used the timings of the demo, all the uh, variable speed things that I put into the demo as the basis for their track. So they, they, I had to give them a click track with all the numbers on it so that they could mirror the, uh, the, the demo completely up to the very end of the song, which is slightly different. But it was kind of great to hear all of that come out exactly the way we had, the way we had thought it would come out. It was really right. great. So, and then, uh, we, and as we're working with Disney, one of the things is Disney at one point asked us if they, if we wanted to be staff writers, uh, for them, and uh, we uh, we turned them down because we wanted to write with all kinds of people. We just didn't want to just be just working with Disney all the time. And what's really interesting is that really the people we really wanted to work with were the Muppets. <laughs> and for some reason, we got our chance in 1992. And what happened was um, our our friend at at uh, Disney, well, th this guy Robert Kraft, who produced the uh, the Little Mermaid original original Little Mermaid soundtrack album, uh, his kids had were big fans of the Disney Afternoon TV show, so uh, he proposed to Disney. He says, "I want to do an album of the of the music from the from Disney Afternoon," and they said, "Okay." And then he called us up about two weeks after he signed the deal and said, I had no idea when I, when I was doing this, um, when, I, when I decided to do this, that it was going to be a Silvershire tribute album because we wrote two of the theme songs for the shows, Gummy Bears and Tailspin. We didn't write the theme song to uh, DuckTales or, or um, Chippendales Rescue Rangers which was a guy named Mark Muller, wonderful songwriter. Um, but we wrote all the songs that they did within the body of all those shows. So about, about uh, seven eighths of the album ended up being songs that Patty and I had written for the various shows. So he liked that. So when he left Disney, he became the musical director over at Henson. And he called us up and said, we're doing a, we're the first Muppet video that they've done since Jim died. Jim had died about two years before. And uh, so this is 1992. And we had the original Muppets, people like Frank Oz, who was Miss Piggy and Fozzie Bear, Dave Goltz, who's, and uh, Steve Whitmire was doing Kermit's voice at the time. So uh, we ended up doing a, two songs for this classic Muppet theater um, a song for the Emperor's New Clothes called Nothing's Too Good For You, uh, which is a double entendre title. Uh, and a song called The Midas Touch, which was sung by Miss Piggy and Kermit. Uh, anyways, we met the people from Disney there. We met producer Alex Rockwell. She's not from Disney. Henson. Alex was from Henson. So that's where we met the Henson people, not you. Yeah, we were meeting the Henson people. We met Brian Henson. And we met Alex Rockwell, who was a producer, and her assistant, Hallie Stanford. Now, Hallie Stanford started off as her assistant, but now she's the president of television. So, and good. Alex Rockwell is still an independent producer. It's still to this day, all these years, creating many shows for him. And one of the shows that she's created most recently is Word Party, which we're doing now at Netflix. Um, then uh, we, the second project we did was a co-production with Nabisco for a Christmas special 
called Mr. Willoughby's Christmas Tree. Uh, and it starred Robert Downey Jr. So another story I will not tell now. No. Um, um, Stockard Channing and Leslie Nielsen and a bunch of new Muppets. And that half an hour special gave us our very first Emmy nomination for all the music of that show. Um, and uh, I, I was gonna, man, I won't play it, but, but you'll hear it sometime. Go to YouTube and watch Mr. Willoughby's Christmas Tree and hear our music. <laughs> so over the years, there's really only been one show that we worked on in an office. And that show was Animal Jam. The Henson Company asked us to come on the lot and what they did is they gave us, they put us in Charlie Chaplin's original vault. So our office was very small and it had this really heavy, heavy door. But you couldn't close it because nobody knew the combination of the lock. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we, that was our office space for working on Animal Jam. And we, we loved this because for all these years, Michael and I have always been isolated working with ourselves and never in an office setting. So this way we were able to work with the creator of the show and the producer face to face. We also, again, had to write a very many, so many songs. I think Michael, wasn't it 72 songs? In yeah, a, we ended up writing, yeah. In a, sh a really short amount of time. So when you do a show this way, you're involved in pre-production, production and post-production. And in pre-production, we wrote and produced the songs to time for the set. And then we recorded the songs with the characters here in Los Angeles. Production requires playback tracks, instrumental and vocal with and without click in order to coordinate with the production and the use of seven cameras on this all live shoot in Orlando, Florida, where we went. And then post-production was in a different studio and Michael played along to score the tracks. Yeah, so I wasn't really like, I, I, it was like my first kind of experience in uh, doing a background score for a show, but it really wasn't. I was just sort of improvising as I went along. Right. And uh, I, I had a lot to learn about it. <laughs> but the next song, the next show we worked on was Henson was Pajamals. Uh, the timing on this show was even more compressed than Animal Jam. In fact, we, we got the, I had just bought a new computer and I decided to go from uh, Garage Band, which I was doing some demos on, to Logic. And I said, oh, it's the same kind of program. It shouldn't be too hard to learn. This is the stupidest thing I've ever done. <laughs> Deciding that I could learn a computer program while I was doing a show. We wrote 12 songs, recorded them with the characters. We had the producer and director in our home studio to do this two time and at the end of 12 days we were on a sound stage with all the songs and um, all the performers the producer yeah with everybody and i turned to patty and i said remind me never to do that again <laughs> so <laughs> all the filming only time we'd ever done live filming with was with henson yeah so the production of that show was picked up by a um, our Belfast called 16 South, and they had this wonderful little warehouse in, Be in Belfast. We went out and visited them. Now, uh, in order to do a co production, two of our regular Muppet characters had to go, and they had to have two. So we had two Irish Muppets and two American Muppets right. doing the show there. And it was quite fun. Um, we, joined, we journeyed to Belfast to sit on the action watched them building sets, re-recording the vocals, and we enjoyed great performances. And um, I have a video to show you. This is a video from Belfast of the, uh, the Muppet characters with the pre-recorded tracks doing their actions. But you get to see their whole body is not just what you see on the screen. So, and, and great. So here it is.
there. And there's a Very nicely done. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's close. It's so in all of our years of writing for Henson and Disney, we always, except for one song, have written for a specific project. And to our knowledge, they have not taken, and I do not believe they do still today, they do not take any unsolicited songs from writers. They are specifically project driven. But the one song we wrote was called, I Wish I Was Magic. And this song came about when kids came to our house for a scavenger hunt. This was the day before we were driving down to Los Angeles. And as they were leaving, I asked, what do you wish for? And this one little girl said, oh, I wish I was magic. Well, we wrote the music that night. And the next day we were driving to LA. We finished the lyric on the way down after missing our turnoff, which added a lot more hours to our drive. We were so involved in writing the lyric to I wish I was magic. So we recorded the song in Los Angeles. We played it for Tom Bocci at Disney. He loved it. He did not know what to do with it. So he put it in a drawer. He also gave us a publishing contract for it. And he told us he named his dog Magic. Five years- The Golden Retriever. <laughs> the Golden Retriever, yes. <laughs> so five years later, we get a call from Ron Kidd, who was now the head of a and at Disney. Tom Bocci was no longer there. He found the song in a drawer. And he then made it the theme for Disney's fairy tale series, their entire fairy tale series. So that was the only song that we had written unsolicited, but it still found a home. Just a couple of months after my dad died, we were approached by Disney to write a song for two Winnie the Pooh episodes back to back, a Thanksgiving uh, show and a Valentine show called A Valentine for You, Winnie the Pooh. And it was for primetime television. And we wrote a total of seven songs, four songs for the Thanksgiving show and three songs for the Valentine show. And the last song, we wrote was going to be sung by Christopher Robin and um, to to mm -hmm. and it was a song we wrote that we that uh, was dedicated to my father so the the fact is we could incorporate our own feelings and our own needs to write something into the shows for these characters it went on to be we we've had we've been nominated for three Emmys uh, and this was our third Emmy the First Emmy uh, nomination was for um, Mr. Willoughby's Christmas Tree. The second one was for I Want to Scare Myself, sung by Tigger in Boo to You Too, 
Winnie the Pooh, a Halloween special. And then this one, a Valentine for you, Winnie the Pooh, uh, Places in the Heart. And here is that song now. This rather small place knows the grandest thing of all. It knows when understanding can be hard to understand. It knows that words aren't needed when you take somebody's hand. It knows that you are with me in everything I do. It's that special corner of my heart, the place that I call you. songs for series with not yet known characters is, is different than writing for known characters. For example, when we got the gummy bears, um, our, our TV series, it was like the, that was the second uh, Disney TV animation series. The first one was called The Wuzzles, which fuzzled or fizzled out or something. <laughs> but we did, we got a chance to do this one. Now, every animation series has a Bible. And what that Bible is that tells you who the characters are, what they want, what they're, where, where, they're, where they're going in life, and how they relate to each other. And it gives you the general nature of the series. For me, that's great, but nothing helps more than meeting with the powers that be to see if you're going in the right direction. We, at this point in time, used to be when we started off at Disney, we uh, were part of a cattle call. And we were part of a cattle call for several years. And uh, what Gary Chrysler would do is take demos home to his kids and they would pick the songs that they liked. And his kids happened to like everything we wrote. So our career, we have Gary Chrysler's kids who we've never met to thank for our career. But in the, in, in the meantime, getting to know Gary was, was good because he was started off as the president of the record company. And then he became the vice president of animation at Disney as they started it up. And they gave us the chance to write the theme song to Gummy Bears. We didn't have to fight off a bunch of people to get it. So, and we came up with a bunch of songs. We it took three months pulling songs together and a lot of things that were that were um, uh, rejected, like this one, which is called The Circle of Friends, which was, we were thinking of it as a theme song, but as you'll see, it's not exactly right. A circle of friends around us, on each other's help we depend. Throughout the world over, our circle will bend. May it never be broken, our circle First of all, it's a waltz. Second of all, it's very gentle. And you really want to have a theme song that gives you power and gives you, shows your characters at their most 
excitable. So we kept writing songs and we kept getting feedback from Gary saying, oh, the Silvergers can do better than that. Well, finally, we were able to- That's meet. not helpful criticism. <laughs> yeah, right. And finally, we were able to meet with him in person. And it was during that meeting that Gary mentioned his love for the fanfare, fanfare in the old Robin Hood series. Yeah. So within three minutes of him saying that, Michael had the music. Yeah, well, oh, you mean like this? He says, yeah, that's good. <laughs> so we wrote the song and the next day we presented it. Dashing and daring, courageous and caring, faithful and friendly with stories to share. All through the forest, they ring out in chorus, Marching along as their song fills the air. Gummy bears bouncing here and there and everywhere. I adventure that's beyond compare. We are the gummy bears. That magic and mystery are part of their history, along with the secret of gummy berry juice. Their legend is growing. They take time and knowing. Take pride in knowing they'll fight for what's right and whatever they do. Gummy bears bouncing here and there and everywhere. I am venture that's beyond compare. They are the gummy bears. Oh, gummy bears. In the prince of danger will be there. Lives and legends that are all can share. That's it. And the there rest all there, was, there all there was to the song, and it was fast to do. The record, I'll tell you a little story about the recording session since it's Kurt Timely. We did a recording session of the of the actual master of the songs. It was done, uh, the original was done by a wonderful composer and arranger, Jeremy Lubbock, and it was like a 67-piece orchestra in uh, Evergreen Studios. And we were recording this, we were doing the song and listening to playback. Oh, the singer, by the way, on the TV series was Joe Williams, who was the son of John Williams and became a year later, the lead singer in Toto. So little aside. Anyways, so we were listening back to the tracks and in to the studio walks, Betty White and Tony Randall and they sit down and they're there sitting there for a few minutes. And uh, Jim Magon, who's the creator of the series turns to me and says, do you know what they're doing here? <laughs> and he said, I have no idea. So I went up to them and said, hi, I, um, are you, uh, you might be in the wrong place. He <laughs> said, are, are you waiting for somebody? He says, uh, and Betty White says, yes. Tony Randall never said a word. And Betty Wright, she stands up and says, well, I never, I've been thrown out of better places than this. <laughs> with, her, with her way of doing it, knowing it's, it, we all just cracked up. She was off the top of her head, the funniest person ever. <laughs> and it was because the only time, I mean, we got a chance to meet her, but that was it. <laughs> anyway, yeah. <laughs> So tailspin, tailspin. Um, that was an interesting show. I had just come back from the Soviet Union, and I was full with full of minor key um, Cossack songs. And uh, Jim Megan calls up and says, "We're doing a show based on Baloo from from the Jungle Book and a bunch of other characters." And uh, I and I said, "Okay." Well, uh, you want to hear something in a minor key? He says, no, no. <laughs> he says, in fact, listen to Sonora by Harry Belafonte from, um, from his Calypso album. And actually, um, it was at the ending of Beetlejuice. It was when, uh, at the, 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 uh, the ending credits, when Winona Ryder is dancing around. Oh, 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 Sonora, watch your body ride. Oh, 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 Sonora, watch your body, right? And I go, oh, okay. So 
forgetting about all the Russian stuff I've been <laughs> getting into my head for the last month, uh, I came up with uh, this. Spin it. Baron grin it. Let's begin it. the first shot down became the became the theme song immediately so which was great <laughs> so i guess i'm going to continue on writing for songs and writing for characters is one thing lately in the last uh, oh i'd say 10 years i ended up scoring shows doing the background music and like i said i had fooled around with it when i was doing um um, Animal Jam, but this time I really knuckled down and learned how to do it properly because the demands of the show, there were many, many episodes. And I came up with the method by listening to other shows, the idea of, this is for doing Dinosaur Train uh, for Henson and PBS. And then another show called Word Party, which is by Henson and is, is on currently on Netflix. They just dropped a new season of that too. But I, but I did the score for all of that. And learning on the job uh, to, to, to write for scores because the, the music that you play in the background is not, if it's done right, it's subliminal. It, you don't really hear it or it doesn't really register to you. But if you hear it, you could associate with the character. And, in opera, the term leitmotif means you have a have a, a uh, theme for a character that follows a character throughout the throughout the work. Well, I did. I incorporated that into the characters for Dinosaur Train. Um, doing a, a, we have a little kid named Buddy, who's a um, a baby, a little boy, Tyrannosaurus Rex, <laughs> living with a Tyrannosaurus family. And I came up with a little thing. And uh, did it on an African kalimba. So what I, not only did I do a leitmotif for the character, but I also gave him an instrument so that every time he does something, that instrument appears. And if I'm not using the theme, the instrument gives him his actions. Uh, and the same thing with the mom character with the dad character. The mom character I had on a harp with this nice little. And that follows her whenever she speaks and the dad. Oops, I can't play it. Can't play it anymore. I used to be able to play it. simple melodies but that is the is the key to giving a character a character uh, his characterization and I had that played uh, two octaves down on a bassoon so that he so that the the father has his sort of a jokey character so uh, happens uh, I mean a uh, jokey character that 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 he instills as he's performing as, as he talks and you don't know, you don't realize uh, that the music is giving you extra hints on how to feel about the characters. If it can be on, ominous, when there's an om ominous feelings happening, it can be joyful, it could be exciting, you can have a parade, you can have a, a football game, or in the case of a, I forget what the dinosaurs called there, they had something like a scrimmage game with a big rock that they would toss around. 
but you create all these all these themes for the show. And almost every episode has, has different characters as well as the normal characters. And you illustrate them all through the music. Um, at the same time, uh, th we uh, the same thing we've done with Word Party, where we have our little themes as well. Uh, it not only solidifies the music, but also the characters to whom the music belongs to. For Word Party, I wrote a theme for each setting in the character. For example, they go to a playroom, they go to the dining room, they go to uh, the playground, they go to a garden, they ride along in a vehicle called the bubble tray. And we wrote themes for all of those things. And then uh, also songs for the show as well. One of the characters is a guy named Bailey. I love, I love this song. This is a song that nobody understands. Uh, why it's, oh, it's it's very popular in the um, in the word party universe. Yeah. Uh, it's called "Under an Applesauce Sky," and I'll kind of explain it maybe if I can. So, um, no, so this, don't explain it. Let people have their own interpretations. Okay. Okay. This is sung by a little blue elephant named Bailey. So. <laughs> Did you be sitting under a tree, feeling the breeze go by? I look up and see, feeling smiling at me, looking at me under, under an applesauce sky. There's a sweet honey bee that's buzzing at me as well as my wings flutter by. Try to tickle my toes, cause anything goes. So one of the things that's really important that we always keep in mind is the fact that we never write down to anyone, child or adult. Kids are people just like anyone else, and they have the sensibilities and the feelings like any adult might have. So the only difference in writing for children or adults is really the subject matter. And we were doing a panel on children's music at the Musicians Institute in LA several years ago. Somebody asked us, who do we write for? Our audience, the execs in the office. I said, I write for myself. And if it moves me, after all, I'm a human too. Chances are it will move you. I never think in terms of hits or market share, just write a good song, that's it. And now Michael's gonna talk a little bit about children's theater, educational touring shows and standalone productions. Okay. I've done a lot of uh, educational touring shows. I was working with both the Mark Taper Forum and the uh, South Coast Repertory Theater, Mark Taper Forum in LA at the Music Center and uh, South Coast Rep in uh, Costa Mesa, right across from the Performing Arts Center. Uh, and uh, we wrote, uh, my, my co-writer, Richard Hallison, who writes book, and I write the music and lyrics. Uh, they deemed them, the educational touring shows were called the Eddie shows. And we did shows from 1989 to 2007. Uh, and they, the shows always had like four or five characters. One of the characters was always a stage manager. We had sets they could take up and, and put back down very easily, uh, and they got two weeks rehearsal before they were got sent out on the road. So they would they would learn a script, songs, and how to build a set and how to break down a set really quickly in two weeks before we send them on the road for six months. And they played for hundreds of thousands of kids 
all over the uh, LA and Orange County area. Um, when you're writing a show, an educational show, there are three different kinds of shows that you might write. One of which is an issue oriented show. Uh, and then there's uh, a history show. And the other is a value oriented show. Now the issue shows deal with things like, you know, drugs, bu uh, bullying, uh, what it's, you know, being in, in, in school, uh, uh, truancy, um, guns, things that are happening in the schools that are, that are problematic. Now issues come and go and they can change constantly. But when you're writing a show with values, values like friendship, giving, dealing with how you deal with bullies, children and grandparents, philanthropy, the power of an individual to make or break society, and life lessons and understanding, those are timeless. So the shows that we wrote that follow those types of values are the ones that have lasted the longest. The other show var variety that we've done are histories, because we, we had a, um, a mandate from uh, Orange County to write histories, California history shows. So we wrote about uh, the gold rush, and we actually wrote a, a show about a kid coming in and living with the Indians, the Humash Indians, um, uh, during the time uh, just post the, uh, the gold rush. And we wrote a show about the Okies coming to California in the 30s. And uh, so we, we dealt with things that had to do with California history that gave us a, a broad picture of the people who were here. We did a show on uh, one of the uh, founders of the aeronautics industry uh, who was associated with Lockheed and his solo flight from, um, from Orange County to, to, um, to Avalon, Catalina and back. The first solo flight back in the 20s for that. And, and it's always been fun to write those kinds of shows, but you have to know the characters like anything else. Um, uh, and you have to keep the values in mind as opposed to write, I, I, as opposed to just writing for issues and just, and making, there was a great show we did called Gift Wrap. And we had three kids, Vera, Chuck and Dave, named after the characters in When I'm 64 by Paul McCartney. But uh, they were three kids and there was a, a, a guy, a woman who was a rapper and she was called the gift rapper. What she did was she gave you a ticket and she gave you a gift. And you got this gift and you could do anything you wanted to with it. Well, all three of these kids learn how and why to give the gift away as a, as a, as a value of, of learning how that having something for yourself is nice, but the greatest gift for sometimes is to give something to somebody who really needs it. So that's like a, a value oriented show. When it was our first, it was Richard and I, my first show that we did. And I, I have a very warm spot in my heart for that show. Um, my favorite project that I did in children's theater, we were assigned to do a, there was a school in East LA, uh, which was a middle school. And we had kids from 11 to 14 years old. And 11 to 14 years old is the time when you don't really censor yourself. And you don't worry about being cool. So, because uh, when you get after that, then you start looking at you, the people around you and you decide you want to be cooler than the other person. And you don't write as honestly as you do when you're not worrying about it. And we went to the school. This was a group of four of us from, uh, from the Mark Taper Forum, Inv Improvisational Theater Project. And we asked the kids, how many of you speak English? And they all said English. And they said, how many of you translate for your parents? And they all raised their hands. There were 30 kids. There were 30 kids from 15 different languages within that group of, of, of people there. And the kids were at first ashamed of their parents. They said, oh, my, my parents are dumb because they don't know English. Then they began to realize that it's just the language is not, has nothing to do 
with who they are inside. We, one of the things that we did was we had them turn off the lights and tell each other ghost stories in the language of their parents and see if the people would get the ghost stories. And they all did because of the way they were told and what they, and, and what they were about. The next thing was to do is have them make up scenes. And they did, they did scenes at this uh, one little family scene called I Hate Spaghetti. And around that, they wrote a song called I Hate Spaghetti. And, uh, and everybody in the cast contributed a line to it. And then we had other people who were doing writing songs about what they wanted. There was this one kid who wrote a song with the lyric goes, work is the really thing I hate. And their teacher said, oh, let's change that to work is the thing I really hate. And I said, don't do that. Let him speak in the language that he wants to speak in now. This is his creativity. This is not for you to get in the way of his creativity. And all I did was play the piano and make give them something to, to, to write to, with to, to write melodies and lyrics to. Um, it was an incredible thing in about, oh, I guess about 10 years ago or so, um, I was visiting, I was watching, a, there was a company of uh, the East West players who went to schools and did Shakespeare bilingually. And I went to visit a friend of mine was in one of those shows. So I went to visit her. And one of these kids from our, the old class came out to me and says, you're Michael Silvershire, right? I got to tell you something. We have all stuck together over the years and we've become teachers and teachers assistants in the schools here because of what we learned in the class about being proud of who we were. Mm -hmm. and, and it was it was an amazing thing to see how the impact of theater and music on people. It, it, it was just, it was amazing. Now, I want to encourage you, and I know that you've got community theaters in Arizona like you do everywhere else. I want to, you, I hope that people will get involved with their community theaters, not just doing Grease or High School Musical, but writing your own musicals. I mean, for Palo Alto, originally the Palo Alto Youth Theater Workshop was a bunch of high school kids getting together and they wrote their own show. And for the next 10 years, Theater Works went on writing our own musicals, shows from, from scratch. And we became part of a community. And I think that's the most important thing that you can do with your music at any time is, is to make community from it. So now Patty is going to talk. So it's one thing about creating a song, but it's another thing about the business of creating a song. And so I'd like to touch down on the importance of keeping songwriters credit. When we were at Disney, the producer Shep Stern called so excited about a new Disney album called Rock Around the Mouse. Little Richard wanted to sing our song, Gosh Golly Goofy, that we wrote for the record. He then said, Shep then said to us, he goes, I want you to know Little Richard wants writer's credit. Michael and Shep were so excited. And I said, no, wait a minute. He did not write it. I stood my ground. They were very upset. The outcome, Little Richard still recorded it and it is on the album, Rock Around the Mouse. The other way, keep moving. the other way, sweetie. Oh, other one. way, other way, keep going. And there's a picture of Little Richard with Goofy. <laughs> our song. So there's talking about tracking your royalties. There are a couple of different types of royalties you can make mechanical royalties, performance royalties. As you all know, performance royalties come from our performing rights associations, such as ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Mechanicals have stopped top statutory rates as on the sale of records, discs, and now streams. When working with Disney, whatever the statutory rate was, they looked upon it as a ceiling and would only pay three quarters of it instead of the top rate which is paid out by most other markets. However, Disney's reason is that their own marketing department would do much more for the song than you could ever do on your own, and that was true. The market now is so different. It's, there's more acceptance among companies like Disney and Henson for co-publishing, unheard of in our heyday. There was a huge company in LA, Deke, who was run by Andy Hayward. We were contacted by their music supervisor. She had followed our work for years and wanted to work for, with us. 
She offered us to write all the music for a musical they were producing. I asked what were the terms. They wanted 100% publishing and 66% of all the writers copyright. I laughed and said that we would not give up any writer's percentage. We turned them down. She told us to look on the floor at all the cassettes of writers who wanted this project. At this time, things were slow for us and we really needed the work, but we could not set a precedent. We had a new attorney working for us on another show. And when he negotiated one of our contracts, he, uh, this was for Henson, he got us not only 100% writers, but 50% publishers participation, which means we don't own any publishing, but we make 50% of the publishing money on this TV show. This was the first and only time we had this in the contract. Henson had a separate account for us through a royalty collecting publishing company. They were then administration company. We spent a few months tracking down all of the extra money we were due because of this clause going over hundreds of royalty statements. I ended up finding $85,000 of back unpaid royalties that were eventually paid to us. So keeping on top of your business is just as important as creating a work. Learn everything you can about your business. There are many organizations like the Arizona Songwriters that give music business and creative seminars. By being involved on every level, you will keep informed and on top of the business. This can only help to elevate your career. And I, I wanted to make a, a, a point in regards to the current market because um, there are companies like Disney and Henson around. It's very difficult to get into them at this point. But the great thing about social media and about what's happening with, uh, with uh, things like, like TikTok and blogs and podcasts, whatever things, you can create your own projects. And this is one thing I would encourage you to do uh, is to find uh, a project that you really want to, you want to make for, for kids or whatever and actually just go about doing it and not being deterred by, uh, by finding the market for it. it. The market will find it one way or the other. So when you have a project- It takes a long time to do it, so. Right, and when you have a project, where do you go from there? Yeah. Think about, first of all, you can think about finding yourself an agent. There are several agencies out there, APA, UTA, William Morris, CAA, just to name a few. One way to get yourself established as a writer songwriter is to send writing examples and, and finding an agent that way. It's always been a medium of needing to demo your work to have something that you can send to people. These days, demos are very much more like master recordings. I think most of you know that. You have to have top sound quality from your instrumental recordings, singing, using WAV files, AIFF files at high quality rates of reproduction. Starting there and then reducing your demos down to MP3s will improve their sound dramatically. Of great importance, when there is a call for material, you want to make sure that your intellectual property rights are protected and copywritten. You don't want to put anything out there that isn't protected if you contact publishers or agents. Another thing you need to find yourself is the publisher or create your own publishing company. Be prepared to share your publishing with bigger companies. Some will insist on a total buyout of your publishing, but always, always keep your writers. And if you're going to be writing a lot of material, you wanna make sure that a publisher can then get it to the bigger organizations. So there's also something, uh, Michael and I never did have an agent and we were very fortunate. We just sort of- we just marketed it ourselves. Um, the, some, something that we don't do and we don't know anything about really, and we haven't, we have not signed on to it, but I will mention it because um, a music producer mentioned this to me for people is TikTok. And it is showing, data is showing that TikTok is now more powerful music discovery than Spotify. It has more than the double number of active users worldwide than Spotify does with an estimated 80 million monthly users compared to Spotify's 356 million. The power of this scale for the music business was drilled home when the study revealed 75% of those TikTok users, an estimated 600 million, say they discover new artists through TikTok. Another key finding from research, 63% of TikTok users say they've heard new music. 
assuming that 100% of Spotify users discover new artists and music on the streamer, that would make TikTok 168% more powerful for artists and music discovery than the world's most powerful streaming service. So you can find out about TikTok by just, or by just researching it um, yourself and, and see where you can go from there. Actually, there was a uh, article in yesterday's New York Times about the power of TikTok in regards to introducing people to new music. Now, the thing is that because the clips are so small, you only get the basic theme of the music. You really don't get the full song. But people are interested in that little piece of music. Go ahead and find out what the rest of the song sounds like. And that's how, it's, that's how it works marketing-wise. So that's a very good, and that's available to anybody. Right. So. so I think folks, that's sort of where we would end it here as um, we've tried to cover the creative, the writing for characters themes, and obviously performance. Um, and if, there, if you do have any questions, I suppose we don't, Michael and I don't have a website. So it's not like you could write us via a website, but possibly through Arizona songwriters and they can get us some a connection that way to you if, if you all would like to have any other questions answered. And actually, this is what, another thing I was thinking of. If people have questions for us after this presentation and they want to get a hold of you, you can get a hold of us and we will try to answer their questions. Right, right. At, 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 any, at any time. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patty and Michael, for such really wonderful information. That was an entertaining and interesting and informative um, time that we got to spend with you. I'm so grateful for your willingness to present in this format. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for thinking of us and inviting us. We wish we were there in person very much. Yeah, definitely.